Okay, all right, we're going to go ahead and get things started. So, this is our work session, Monday, February 12th at 4.30, Thomas J. Smith, Council Chambers, City Hall. We're going to roll around hill tonight. Um, we've got a proclamation for the 2017 Officer of the Year, Officer Lucas Peterson. Um, looking forward to that. We've got some Mayor's Awards as well, Kay Russell, Margie Marshall, Barbara Carl Carlson, Lynn Osinski and Joanne Williams, looking forward to that as well. Uh, number three is public hearing, consideration of an application for CDBG pilot program, upper story rental rehab program funds through IEDA. This is a project that uh, the Southeast Iowa Regional Planning Commission was asked to apply for through IEDA. Um, it's for funds for upper story uh, redevelopment. Um, for this project, they're looking at the book and buildings uh, area in downtown, specifically 522 Jefferson Street, which is the West Book End Building. Um, the grant covers up to 500000 for uh, rehabilitation cost. Um, they're looking at an approximately $800,000 project. Uh, this um, does need to go through the city um, for application. Uh, the funds go to the applicant, and the city's match is uh, 1000 per living unit. Um, they're proposing two units, so uh, it would be $2,000, and our tax abatement program, existing program, covers that match, so we don't have to supply any direct uh, assistance. It would just be through the tax abatement program. Um, Dan Eberhardt with the Regional Planning Commission will be here on uh, Tuesday next week. Um, this is, since it's uh, through the CDBG funds, they ask that a public hearing be held, and they have to go through um, kind of a list of information the needs, the um, program. This does benefit 80% uh, of median income limits uh, for Des Moines County. Um, so for a one-person household in Des Moines County, that uh, maximum income is 35,800. Uh, Four-person, for example, would be 51,100 and so on. So um, again, they're looking at uh, right now doing two units in that West Book End building. Any questions on that? Everybody's good? Yep. It's good to me. Number four, public hearing consideration of approval of development agreement with Park West LLC, including annual appropriation tax increment payments, an amount not to exceed $350,000. <coughs> Mr. Tisla? This is the final step in the process uh, as we've worked through the urban renewal plan amendment, the designation of a TIF uh, district. Uh, TIF ordinance and now a development agreement. Um, this lays out uh, some of the more particulars for this uh, project. Um, some of the requirements as stated under A, developer covenants, uh, number two, infrastructure project construction. Um, the developer agrees to complete the construction of infrastructure in accordance with the timeline and specifications in Exhibit C. Um, we do have a couple of exhibits. We will have information, more dates or specific information for the council meeting. Um, that would, Dan, just briefly before the meeting, we'll get that. Uh, so it's in the packet uh, before next meeting. Um, but that'll just lay out the time frame for in installation of the infrastructure. And then there'll be some uh, estimates on construction commencing for the housing project and then estimated build out time. Um, and then exhibit D will talk, have the developer's estimate on current taxable value, uh, incremental value, um, and their estimate on payouts for that. So. We'll have that information in the, uh, for the council meeting. Um, but again, back to this number two, uh, upon completion of the infrastructure project, dev developers should provide documentation to the city of cost incurred uh, related to completion of the project. Uh, eligible infrastructure costs may include design and construction of the public improvements, landscaping, grading. Um, upon acceptance of the documentation, the total infrastructure cost Shown in the invoices shall be represent the maximum amount of payments that we made to, by the city to the developer under this agreement, um, or three hundred fifty thousand. Um, that's the the cap, regardless, is that three hundred fifty thousand dollar amount. Um, this follows the same process as uh, other TIF agreements or TIF rebates. That's an annual appropriation. Um, and then having to set aside thirty four eight point four percent. 
is the minimum percentage which is applicable to the low and moderate income set aside. Uh, this shall be retained by the city for use in provisions um, to assist low and moderate income families uh, as required by section 403.22 of the state code. And the city reserves the right to allocate funds accumulated through this in any lawful manner of its choosing. So it has to benefit individuals low to moderate income. Uh, it can be anywhere in the city. It can be through a grant program or a direct subsidy or otherwise, but that's something that the council can decide uh, based on the code allowances, what you want to do with those funds. And that comes in as development occurs. It's not a upfront lump sum or anything. It, it occurs as develop, development builds out. Uh, same as his tax rebate. Um, so it won't be something all at once. It'll be continual over the 10-year the time period. <coughs> if you have anything else, Jim, on the tax or TIF rebate process or no, I just, That's at least two budget cycles out to mm -hmm. have something in place for them. But it, it is something as this moves forward that we'll have to develop a policy for how we would be using that. Any questions? Mr. Cahill's here as well. If you have any questions of him, um, my part. Everybody's good? <coughs> I'm good. Number five is a resolution approving an agreement with Stanley Consultants, Inc. to perform construction inspection for Mount Pleasant Street Bridge. Mr. McGregor. In front of you is a resolution approving a professional services agreement with Stanley Consultants, uh, who is also doing the design work on Mount Pleasant Street. This uh, PSA, or Professional Service Agreement, is for the inspection and construction administration. Um, the dollar figure is uh, fairly substantial. It's 541000 not to exceed dollar figure. Um, I can kind of break that down a little bit. Uh, so they're hiring out some uh, of the inspection because it is a bridge. They have to do some piling type work. Um, and that's at like 74000 so try and to relate it to what if, if we were to do the inspection, we would charge 7% of the project cost against it, uh, coming to about $305,000. We wouldn't be able to do all the construction ins inspection. We don't have the qualified uh, people on staff to be able to do a lot of it. Um, and with the workload that we have, um, I recommend approving this. So I can answer any questions specific about the PSA. Um, let me just clarify. So where it says testing for 74000 that's actually where they are inspecting? They, yeah, they have to hire just another out. Word for they that? have to uh, send in um, and have a something about the load-bearing of capability of the pilings um, and have to have that sent back in. So okay. we don't have that capability. We don't have any of the testing materials or supplies to be able to do that. Okay. Have you looked at other prices if we tried to do it ourselves? Another firm, for instance. No, have you looked into it to see what uh, it would cost us? Yeah. Uh, well, we even charge. If we, even if we hired, because I know that we don't have the staff to do, to do it. This, this is what needs to be. What people want to know is, um, have we looked at what the price would be? That even if we had to hire somebody temporarily to come in and help. You get, you put know. someone on staff. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Billups. Sure. What Mr. Billups said. Put someone on staff. Well, what we would charge as far as an engineering towards the project goes as this, at the same percentage, but we would have to go out and hire somebody. I don't know what that cost would be as far as hiring a temporary staff member, especially for this specific type of work, um, to bring them on hand to do that type of inspection. Um, that is the reason why you're going to end up paying a premium on having them come in and do the inspection for this specific project. Nick, uh, on, a, on an annual basis, how many projects do you think that we do where if you were to go out and try and find somebody that we would be able to use their expertise. We've got several large infrastructure projects coming up. We're talking about, I'm just thinking, six years out, I mean, we're going to have the, the Bridge of Cripple Park. I mean, do you feel like it would be worth our, a bang for our buck to, instead of paying, I, some of these you're not going to be able to avoid. The sending material off, if we don't have the equipment, we don't have the equipment. But do you feel like it would be worth our or uh, dollars and cents to go out and see if we can find somebody that would be able to offer the expertise that we don't currently have in-house? Um, I, I don't think it probably would. Regardless of the workload that my current staff has, um, I don't think that you're going to go out and find a, a structural inspector like this um, for fairly cheap to keep, the, to keep them on for a year, because that's what you're talking about. You're talking about a, a year-long project. But but next year we've got projects and do we have projects that we would use them for the year after? But to be able to justify somebody of this magnitude to inspect 
roads, I wouldn't want to pay them that. Okay. If you understand what I mean. I do. But pay them to pay the premium for that person to inspect something that you could pay somebody less for. Sure. I'm just trying to figure out if there's any way to save the premium that we're paying on, because it seems like we're constantly going out and trying to find people to come in and help us with studies. Well, if we can. Well, I would say bridges is something that it's we're different. not. It's going to be different. Yeah. We're completely out of scope from for that type of work. All right. Good. You answered my questions. You guys good? I'm good. good. Thank you. Mr. Mann. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying what those abbreviations were, too. Appreciate that. Nice job. And number six is a resolution approving urban revitalization tax exemptions pursuant to Chapter 404 of the State Code of Iowa Tax Abatements. Stephanie? So this is an annual resolution that we do um, that's due to the county. Um, so they know which properties we've approved to get the tax abatement. Um, so you can see in the Exhibit A, it lists all the residential um, qualifiers that have come in, filled out our form, you know, have qualified. We go through a um, application process that we make sure they've gotten, um, they filled it out, they've gotten their building permits, and they've actually, you know, are occupying it. All those requirements have to be meet and met, and then you meet the. Um, February 1st deadline and then the next step is for you guys to approve it then we send over the addresses um, to the county and then they take it from there so you'll see we do have dollar amounts listed those are just estimates that are from the building permit it's up to the county assessor that they'll assess these properties so those totals really are kind of um, just dollar figures on the on the paper but at least you can see the type of renovations and new residential homes we've had in the last year um, and you can see what they've chose, if they've chose the 10-year abatement, the three-year abatement. Yes. Very nice. Does anybody have any questions on the resolution itself or this process that we do? You guys good? Okay. And then we always, at this time of the year, get the, the question asked, how much is already being abated? So I do have that schedule. Step. <clears throat> and I'll have this available for Leon next week. <laughs> Thank you, Steph. <laughs> thinking ahead, thinking ahead. Yeah. So you can see they it's comparing the two tax years, the 26 year and the 2017. Um, our the exemption change has gone down by about the 412,000. Um, so we do have some properties that are falling off that have either you know used their three years or 10 years. Um, and then at the bottom, I just kind of put it in dollars and cents. You divide. These are the real assessed values. Again, this is the amount that's being abated. Um, so I do it on our tax rate. So you can see it's close to 540-some thousand dollars each year that's being abated through this, these programs. You guys have questions? Thank you, Steph. Thank you. We thank you, and Leon thanks you. <laughs> right. Or maybe not. I don't know. Okay. Uh, moving on to the uh, consent agenda. Uh, the first is resolution approving renewal of taxi cab, vehicle for hire license for Robin Canova, doing business as uh, A to Z Taxi, LLC. You guys good? Mm -hmm. Questions? All right. Uh, just stop me if you need to, if I'm rolling too fast. Number two is a resolution awarding bid for the 2017 Law Enforcement Center site work improvements. Big Chief. I just want to give you a little update on that. I think we're going to award that contract to the lowest bidder, which was Scyther and Cherry out of Kilcock for $57,000. That site work improvement was budgeted at $60,000, and the first time we went out was $72,000. But with that said, nobody really bid the asphalt inlay. We're working on options of that. I, and I think my suggestion is going to be is, this, since we have a contract a concrete contractor on site it's going to be just as cheap or cheaper to go ahead and infill that with concrete it won't look as pretty but by the time we paint it and you got cars sitting in there who's really going to notice the difference by the plans we were going to move that entrance to main street it needs to move south or we lose three parking spots well with that there's a utility pole in the way which they finally got back to us Alignment. today to get that moved so there's still, and it doesn't sound like since we're a city entity that they would charge us to do that, 
but there's a little bit of confusion with that. And so when I really looked at the plan, I thought, well, we need some money for this, this inlay anyway. What would happen if we eliminate the Main Street exit and use the current, the, if you think about Valley Street the way it used to be where you would pull in off of Valley, drive around, go through the drive through then back out. And to me, that not only makes the parking lot flow better, but we can increase our space by three sites. And we don't have to move that drive, demolition the sidewalk, get down to grade, and pour a new drive. Right so they're looking at those options right now. But I think in the long run, when, we, when this works, this, this bid would, might require a change order for the infill. But it's still going to be, I'm, I'm really thinking with the lack of the grade work in the infill, it's going to be almost a push. So, I mean, with that said, I think we're far better off to approve this, get the demo work done, and then when the infill comes along, we'll see if we we'll just do that with concrete instead of asphalt. And I think that, you know, it's going to save money. The first time we bid was 72, and we're at 57 now. I don't think that's going to be the end of it, but it's going to be well under what it was bid the first time. Okay. Okay. Any questions? It's great to see. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chief. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, number three is a resolution approving the purchase of easements from 2830 Winegard Drive, pen 1131-176-015 for the construction of a storm sewer associated with the Vineyard Drainage Project. Nick McGregor. So as you stated, uh, the resolution here approves the uh, purchase of a permanent easement for storm sewer associated with the Vineyard easement. Uh, this is just a plat. If you want to show the map, that probably gives a better description of what it really is. Um, so we have a, a storm line that will run. Um, Vineyard Street is actually more like that in, in reality of the way I would look at north. So that line would run north, dump into the ravine. Um, it is owned uh, by the low rent housing. Um, and so we are not, we're not paying anything for the permanent easement. We're going to do some grading work in the area, um, and they're going to grant us easements through here. So pretty pretty good deal I think so recommend approval council good Nick says it's a pretty yeah. good idea what do you guys think what do you guys think of what Nick thinks it doesn't cost us any money so I think he's in the right direction Touché. Mm -hmm. okay thank you sir uh, number four is a resolution approving Americans with Disabilities Act transition plan Jesse, Jesse Howe city engineer Eric's working on getting something here for me, I think. So uh, what we're talking about today is the uh, transition plan. And basically what it is, it's the plan that outlines where we're at now, you know, how much we have to do for complete compliance and what we have to do to get there. Uh, this plan specifically only addresses sidewalk ramps because it's kind of a a bigger topic when you get the Department of Justice coming in and, and looking at you for compliance. Um, we identify ramp replacement priorities, how we monitor and track which ones are compliant, which ones aren't, and, and we also have a grievance procedure uh, that's included in the plan to where if there's somebody with disabilities and they have a, a hard time, you know, making a transition on a sidewalk or across the street or something, they can submit that and, and get it in front of us. Uh, why do we need a transition plan? Again, like I said. The government said so. Yeah. So, <laughs> That's why. right. In, in 1990, uh, the Department of Justice required public entities with more than 50 staff members to upgrade all of this ADA uh, type of stuff. So they knew that a lot of the communities couldn't do it right away. So as a substitute for that, you can develop this transition plan and say, well, here's what we know is out there and here's how we're planning to address it. Um, enforcement on that, if you don't have a good plan in place, it can look just like uh, what the DNR is doing on sewer separation with us. In fact, they've done that with Cedar Rapids where they come in and say, okay, now you have to replace this much on this schedule or you know, you're gonna get fined and, and everything else. So, you know, really by putting this in place, it's more of a uh, bargaining chip if if something ever happens like that. So, uh, so our compliance uh, strategy, I kind of have it boiled down here uh, for just the curb ramps though. Um, at some point we may add, you know, 
building ADA compliance. That, we're only 10% compliant with, uh, man, I thought we did more than that. Well, we've been doing a lot lately. Um, in some of the intersections, you'll see where they have the stamped in concrete, and that's actually not compliant per the current regulations. I thought uh, I thought they said that, I thought that was going to, uh, that they were going to look past that, that that was going to apply. Well, you'll see on my n next couple of slides, we're going to address those last. We're, we don't really have those on a heightened priority, and I'll, I'll get to that later, but technically right now, per the current standards, those are not acceptable. Why are they not compliant? <laughs> because the government said so. <laughs> yeah, basically what it gets it down to. It still provides a graded slope, right? It provides a graded slope, and they, they have those domes stamped in there, uh -huh. but those domes pop off a lot of the time. Yep. And another part of why they have them there are for people uh, that have trouble seeing things. They have to be clearly distinguishable from the rest of the concrete is what they tell you. So they have to have those red truncated dome panels in there or they're noncompliant. So. Now, Jesse, those are the ones that look kind of like Legos? That's yep. Okay, yep. got it. Yep, and predominantly in town we use the red ones. There's some other organizations that will use yellow ones, but okay. uh, that's really what you need. You're supposed to have to have the visual contrast in the sidewalk ramp. So you're saying that they don't like the Legos, Jesse? <laughs> <laughs> they do like the Legos. They don't like, like the, the stamps. stamps. Oh, thank you. Thank you. They do like, like the Legos. Legos. They do like the Legos. Appreciate that. Thank right. you. <laughs> so... Uh, so basically how we're addressing this is we've had $40,000 in our budget to address sidewalk ramps, and I believe that was road use tax based. Um, what we also will continue doing and we've done for the last few years is when we upgrade a road and we have a crosswalk through that road, both the ramps on either side get replaced at that point in time. So, so you're not just going out and, you know, going all over town replacing ramps. Um, <coughs> And then, uh, again, we're, we're allowing for that grievance process to where if somebody in town has an issue, they can, they can let us know, and we, we'll move that to the top of the list. We've so. only got 17,000 of them, Jesse. Yep. So, uh, you know, we should be jamming <laughs> on that, right? <laughs> we do a handful every year. Probably last year I'd venture to say we were around 100. Because we're everybody, yeah, you guys are everywhere so, doing them. But, yeah, yeah we, there, when you is, got 17,000. Is there... It, there's there's nothing to protect us though that to say that what we're doing now is compliant if they come in and change the rules another five years from now because what we were doing before was compliant previously right yes no not exactly uh, not exactly there was, a, there was a point in time where it was but yeah. even look at like Mount Pleasant Street was a is an example of where we put in the, the stamp. stamp yeah and it wasn't compliant and, and they had yeah. us take them out and put them in okay. appropriately. Federal Highway came in and did their review, and we had to take out all the stamped ones and put in okay. Lego type. How many well, of those I'm, do I'm we have? Legos rule. <laughs> uh, <laughs> most of those are in that two percent. Okay. Uh, with the the stamped. But right. you do have them listed somewhere, so in case they would come in ten years from now and, and say, "Hey, these are not." We can say, well, we did these before, and they were compliant. Yeah. Not that that matters. Yeah, every every time we do one, we have our GIS database, mm -hmm. and it's not something you can see on the Des Moines County GIS, but our internal one, you know, we'll have a date on it and a project that we upgraded it with and cool. what the slopes were and all that good stuff. So, so our replacement priority, like we were talking about earlier, um, the highest priority will be the ones that we get grievances about uh, where there's an immediate need. Um, the second will be the non-compliant curb ramps in high traffic areas, so around schools, public buildings, that type of thing. Uh, those are where we're going to focus on with that $40,000 a year. Um, and then the non-compliant uh, curb ramps in the bicycle and pedestrian plan, and then you get down to where, you know, there's ones that have never been touched before, but hopefully as we repair all the streets around town, we get to those where we're not really chasing the, with the $40,000 a year type of funds. So. And then the last, the lowest priority there were the curb ramps that were compliant at one time, but not anymore. So, so budget-wise, we can do about 40 of them a year, give or take? Uh, thereabouts. Depends, you know, how complex they are. If they got really steep slopes, sometimes we have to put retaining walls in and that type of thing. Okay. But, but it's about 40 a year with that set-aside money and then, you know, generally another... 50 
or so with road funds. Yeah. Do we have uh, no, that's nothing I I'll, I'll talk to you about that off to the side. It's no big deal. Okay. Uh, do you guys have any other questions for Jesse? State wise, is it, is it called grievance problem when they have a problem? I just I don't like that name. Well, Sorry. that's <laughs> it's just a personal thing. He, there's a there's kind of templates for these things, and it's okay. just a grievance process is oh, okay. how they refer to it. So I didn't do much with that. Jesse, other than the sidewalks, mm -hmm. is there anything else in the community that needs to be addressed from an ADA's compliance standpoint? Yeah, there is, and and in fact, we had a complaint come through for the depot where. You know, there was some uneven stuff. We addressed all of that pretty quickly because we already had plans to do it. But mm -hmm. uh, within buildings, like most of your restroom type uh, fixtures and things, the ADA is really specific on where you put the, you know, paper towel dispensers, sinks, all kinds of stuff. So, so if you look in the CIP plan, this is one where, in the, this is a study that we're or piece that we're implementing now. Two years out, we'll roll out the the, the buildings. As, as one that we're looking looking to get the, the plan put, put together on that. So that'll include government buildings yes. and privately owned structures? Not privately no, owned. Not just privately public. Owned, just government buildings. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So it'll be like parks, uh, this building, different library, that type of thing. Okay. And then sidewalks eventually, but that one's going to be a pretty complex issue to tackle as well. And the library is not going to have probably a significant number is it? I mean I'm assuming it would, would have been built with those standards, right? It shouldn't have a tremendous amount, but All I'd right. say that yeah. even it could potentially have some. It could potentially, but it would be a lot lower like moving, you know, toilet paper holders, that and type it, of thing. Okay. Part of the issue there is is that just because somebody it was built fairly recently, you still not everyone who's who's building to ADA standards is really building to what the Department of Justice looks at as what the appropriate standards should okay. be. Okay. And I, I think that's probably the, been the largest thing we found, is even with the depot, as we want to do that, um, we want to address that kind of. Sure. Yeah, the, uh, <clears throat> the standard that they use on, on buildings and some of the uh, vertical clearances and the protruding objects, it's, I mean, you're talking a quarter of an inch, mm -hmm. and they will, they will quote, write you up for those issues. <laughs> And so when we had the audit done at the depot, we were able to take care of quite a few uh, with just staff on hand, moving certain objects. Um, you know, for instance, the trash can was out of compliance. <laughs> and all you literally have to do is just sh sh shoot it, s move it over, but it was out of compliance per their audit. Um, to give you kind of an understanding, even though it's newer, it doesn't necessarily mean it is in compliance. Right. Cedar Rapids, uh, they did a Iowa League of Cities ADA um, presentation on it, and they built a brand new building, um, and they spent seven million dollars on the building, and they had to come back the very next year and spend three quarters of a million to fix all the ADA issues that were non-compliant. So, it's it's one contractors not understanding how how they're supposed to be fixed. Right. Um, I think they actually have an ADA person on hand at Cedar Rapids that goes out and inspects it all for them because they have the consent order to do all these things. Um, we're not at that point. Um, and so like they said, this transition plan will just be for curb ramps and eventually sidewalks and then in, uh, for facilities. And we're two years away from focusing. Next step. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and so like this building is going to probably have Oh, this building will, and you know, even as we've been talking about it, starting to do some upgrades to some of the restrooms, uh, we want, want to make sure that as we do those upgrades that those aren't going to, that we don't do them in a way that doesn't fit in. Into the ADA. Yes. Or you spend money now that you end up tearing, tearing out, out in two years. Right. So we'll, as we do those kind of upgrades, we do them whether we have a facility, the, a, a full facility plan or not, but mm -hmm. we will do those to the extent we can in, in compliance with and the best part about getting one of these transition plans in place is, as Jesse alluded to, is you can keep them away from you sort of thing. If you if you get a complaint, something that gets to the, uh, attorney, the U.S. Attorney's yeah, Office or the Department of right. Justice, if you provide them a transition plan and say, listen, we understand that that's out of compliance. We are working towards it. It's in, you know, two years from now, we'll, we'll be able to fix that properly. 
they won't send anybody. They'll typically just write a letter and respond, you know, thank you and make sure this gets fixed. But it's when they show up at your front door with smart levels and, you know, run around town checking everything that's out of compliance. You don't want to do that's that. When you have, that. That's yeah. what we want to try to avoid. Just so you know, these chairs are out of ADA, ADA compliance. I've been trying to tell Jim that he doesn't get it, so somebody make sure that registers in his head. You guys, are you guys good? Yes. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Jessica. Okay. Let's flip the page. Number five is resolution approving application for funds through the Community Catalyst Building Remediation Program from the Iowa Economic Development Authority. This is a, a program that. Uh, allows a maximum grant award of $100,000 for a, a project in a community. It's designed to assist uh, communities with redevelopment, rehab, or deconstruction buildings to stimulate economic growth or reinvestment in the community. Um, and there's a million dollars available statewide. Again, maximum grants, 100,000. 40% of the funds are awarded to cities with populations under 1,500. So about six grants statewide for cities larger than 1,500. Uh, so it is a competitive uh, grant application. Uh, there was a pre-application process that we went through. Uh, so uh, we did, uh, I guess, go through that process and were allowed to continue on uh, looking to apply for the former police building at 412 and 424 North 3rd Street um, for this process. Uh, um, and the city must be the applicant and provide financial assistance or in-kind resource. Uh, part of our assistance was the sale price of the building. Uh, we also have tax abatement that um, would uh, qualify as a, assistance as well. Um, and again, looking at uh, what the impact is on the community, specifically downtown in this case, and uh, driving some economic growth or reinvestment in the community. And uh, feel that hotel and what they're looking to do would be a very uh, positive project to submit. Um, but again, just with the amount of funds available, it's not guaranteed. Um, but uh, something that we're working through the process on. The applications are due uh, beginning of March, um, and uh, I'm not sure the award date if that's in May or June. But I think the turnaround time's fairly fairly soon on that. So, is it oh, okay? This is something that this was a grant that uh, Steve Prever and Charlie Nichols had gone to a presentation on right around Thanksgiving. Uh, this is when they rolled it out, and you essentially had to have a project in hand at, at, at that point to be able to move forward on this. So it, had, there weren't, it, it wasn't something where we could go and uh, you had to be able to identify something that you could work on very quickly. Right on. Is this an annual thing? So every year? It, we can I don't know if this will be or not. Do you have an idea on that, Steve? This is the first time it's been off. Steve, so if you want to come up to <clears throat> On their website, it says funding based on annual availability, but we don't know if it's Yeah, this is the funded. first time IEDA has done this, um, so it remains to be seen whether it's an annual thing. So. The timing was really good for, for this particular project. So Great. I think the part of what they're, they're going to want to make sure that whatever projects that they choose, that they can be very successful on, and they can really point to uh, having an impact right. in those local communities, mm -hmm. um, because they they're, this is something they're trying to sell at us on a statewide basis for uh, potential future funding. And the ripple effect of this project could be fairly far-reaching. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. Everybody's good? Mm -hmm. All right, I can dig it. Number six is a resolution of supporting and approving application to the Wellmark Foundation's large match grant application for the improvements to D. Edwin and Gladys White Memorial Park. Mr. Chisholm. We applied for funds, uh, I think, as a separate grant through Walmart last year. Uh, just based on the timing, um, we want to apply again this year. We do have funds available for the project, but um, would be able to, uh, I guess, if we receive funds, uh, create a, a little larger project and also maybe divert some of our funds to other projects. So um, based on the timing, we wanted to go forward with this application. Similar project, if Stephanie could show up on the overhead, uh, for those that are fairly new to council what the plan is with White Park. Um, look, um, a 
lot of the lots around this area are very small lots, uh, very limited yard space to be able to, uh, whether it's play soccer or catch or football or uh, something in that aspect. Uh, but allowing a, a larger open play field there, uh, replacing the playground with a new playground and some new walkways there as well. Um, uh, looking at different uh, playground uh, site concepts, uh, kind of an open visible or view shed there uh, through the playground uh, for safety and uh, making the families comfortable that are there as well as being able to see uh, anywhere that you're at in that area. So um, that's kind of the concept that we're looking at. And uh, again, we have starker funds allocated to this project, but if we're able to get some outside funding to maybe enhance the project and also potentially divert some of those funds elsewhere. Uh, one thing on the shelter, we have awarded bid on the shelter that will happen uh, this spring um, regardless and uh, look, still working through uh, the play field, quite a few se sewers in this area. So the shelter is a for sure thing this yeah. summer? Yeah. Wow. Uh, working through with uh, Public Works, there's quite a few sewers. Uh, this is, um, and I don't have the map here, but uh, combined sewers in this area are crisscross the field. So uh, seeing how we can... Uh, work with that on the open play field concept as well. What's the cost of the playground? What did we have budgeted on that, do you remember? Total project was around 100000 And what did you, what's the grant application amount for? It's up to 100000 one-to-one match. Okay. Thanks for bringing that out, my friend. I'm really surprised that you did, but I appreciate it. I know it's totally against your character. Let's just keep moving. We don't need any problems tonight. So Eric, you said it's a one-to-one -one match. So if we're going to spend 100 grand, we're going to get 50 from them. Or if, if we spend 50, we could get 50 from them. Sure. If, if they award us 100, is it based off your project size, or they'll give? They'll say. No, it's based on what we'd apply for. In okay. The shelter probably wouldn't be uh, part of that because it, it could be done beforehand. Um, it's money that you haven't spent, so uh, we can kind of go over what amount. If our total project's 100,000, we'd probably apply for 50 and. Spend fifty and then save that extra fifty from Starker. And then would you do we use the money yes. paid for the project as match money then? Or for the shelter? What's that? Is shelter money being used as the match money? No, just total project. Okay. Total park project. Any other questions? Yep. John's excited, wants to get in with his inner child <laughs> to hang out on the swings. I think it's a great thing. <laughs> I'll join him man. I love it. It's okay. kind of a, a good timing project, too. They're uh, working on a rehab project at Maple Hills Apartments as well, so Fantastic. that'll have a transformation there as well. So. That's always good. Okay. You guys satisfied? Yep. Yes. All right. Let's move to public hearings. Uh, a is consideration of plans and specs for the 2018 Tama Building Permeable, permeable Alley. Um, I'm just going to roll down. If you guys want to say something, please feel free. B is consideration of plans and specs for the 2018 Agency Street widening project East End. C is consideration of an ordinance rezoning the property locally known as 333 Kern Street from R2 single family residential to C1 limited commercial zoning district. D is consideration of an ordinance amending the code of ordinances of the city of Burlington, Iowa by amending provisions pertaining to the standard penalty application, or I'm sorry, penalty applicable to certain uh, Struggling, man. Certain. <laughs> you got it. You can get it. You can get it. Okay. okay. All right. Let me, let, me, let me do this. I can do this. 333, consideration of an ordinance rezoning the property locally known as. <laughs> Where are you at? Are we going to do this? Yeah, here. You're on board. Consideration of an ordinance amending. I blame this on. Do you want me to read it? I, bl I can do this. I can do this. <laughs> Mayor Pro Tem, I can do yeah, this. Okay. I can sign it for you. Read it for me, please. <laughs> Consideration of an ordinance amending the code of ordinances of the city of Burlington, Iowa, by amending provisions pertaining to the standard penalty applicable to certain sections of the code and violation <gasps> thereof. <laughs> and so, anything? <laughs> okay. All right, then. I know it was ugly. <laughs> Eight is uh, public hearings uh, previously scheduled by city council. A is a consideration of general, general obligation loan agreement and the principal amount not to exceed $8,500,000. And then B's consideration of 2018 amendment to urban renewal plan for Burlington Consolidated Urban Renewal Area related to use of incremental property tax revenues for public improvements. That is March 5th for both of those. So we're moving on to discussion. Huh? You also had E, said consideration of the fiscal year 2018 budget. 
guys. He did skip over. Yes. Yes, yes, James. Thank you, Aunt E. Consideration of fiscal year 2018-2019 budget. Thank you so much. I'm having a hard time reading tonight. It happens to me every once in a while. So are we good now? Yep. I'll schedule your eye appointment for you. I appreciate that. <laughs> Make sure you're the doctor that's really cheap. Okay. All right. Future budget. Let's talk about it.
to me makes sense that those are two of the primary things that we we consider is uh, eliminating the, the positions that you're funding with with those grant sources um, but with that being said um, option one looks at eliminating uh, one grant funded police position and all six fire positions that are funded through the safer grant um, as you look at that uh, just the, the way that safe, especially the safer grant is done on, on that. Uh, the, the final two years of the, is it one or two years, we were at 65%. Last year of the grant, we're at 65%. Um, we, have, we have a significant cost in there that you have to hold on to positions when grant funding is getting seriously de depleted. Um, and we're gonna have those expenditures. We can't get rid of a deficit for those by eliminating the positions at the end of the grant. There has to be some source of funds to try to offset the deficit is, that is accumulating to, to cover our match. Uh, with that in mind, uh, I looked at the, at the dedicate part of the manor sale project as that one-time funding source. I don't, I don't advocate using something like that to cover ongoing operational costs, but if you're using it to fill a specified time gap, it can be done to help you, you work through it. And I, I wanted to put that in there just so you can think about that as an option. Not to use that as a sole thing to try to deal with it, because you can't. This is not on the cost. Right on. Um, and I also, so as you look at that with that top, top example, um, the first year when you, when you allocate a, a, a significant portion of the manor sale, you end up with for in, if you do that in fiscal year 2020, um, the general fund will have a, a good sized positive balance, but then you use it to try to help offset what ends up being ongoing deficits in the three years after, mm -hmm. primarily in 21, where you're transitioning between a grant run running out and the, the, the safer grant running out in the time where you can look at eliminating positions. Um, it ends up with a total over four years, for those four years, a total deficit of 26,000, so we're not quite doing it. That being said, even that 26,000 isn't getting you as far as you really need to be. Your general fund balance should be growing over time if you're gonna stay at a 15% of expenditures when you know your expenditures each year grow a tad. So we should be seeing actually a, over four years that, that general fund balance should be growing by 150,000. Um, matching it dollar for dollar I'm not as concerned about because you are making projections five years out but getting close is important um, I did a option two throws in some different things that you can look at uh, looking at uh, instead of six fire positions only three at the end of the grant um, it has that altered CTAA the city county City Township um, what am I thinking of? Ambulance Association, <laughs> CTAA. Uh, within that formula right now, it, it currently has 12 personnel allocated towards ambulance service. It has uh, some of the management oversight positions that are included in that. And out of that, we, we balance out the revenues that are collected within the ambulance department versus those expenditures, whatever the if there's a deficit in there, um, the CTAA pays their percentage of the call basis of that deficit. So we have, and we do that on a three-year rolling average. Our current three-year rolling average for the percentage of ambulance calls that's outside of our city limits, but in the CTAA uh, boundaries is right, it's been at 17%. So they pick up 17% of the operating costs. Um, this altered CTA cost allocation would be suggesting to move three more personnel over into that ambulance staffing um, funding scenario, which would would make sense based off of the changes that have occurred within the, what the department is and, and the personnel it takes to truly run it. You could almost, we don't, you could almost make an argument to add six positions over there. I think that might be a little strong. Uh, 
uh, to go with six, but three certainly is justified. Um, six would be fully staffing three separate ambulances at all times uh, to provide ambulance service, but that's not necessarily, we're not quite to where we are always staffing through three ambulances at all times with our current staffing scenario. Um, if you do that, I've just made an estimate based off of maintaining those three positions and what the revenue growth would be on the ambulance side for, for revenue. Um, what, you, what would the impact be? Actually, I didn't even think about the revenue growth because this is just looking at the ad additional cost and the impact of that. The revenue growth is in there regardless. Um, there for 17% of our costs for three personnel and, and putting that against the deficit. 17% um, of our costs in 21 as an example is 25,000. It grows to 33 and then 48. Uh, and the reason it grows so much is the roll off of the grant funding. And we do a, the 21 is based off of our fiscal year 20 uh, operations. So we look at fiscal year 20, 20 uh, actual operations, what the result of the expenditures versus revenue were, and then they pay us the following year their pro rata share of that deficit. So it, it falls, be the change in that is going to fall behind where we see changes in our expenditures. Um, but you can't do that and have it work by itself. Uh, you could, you could though look at as we end our current three-year agreement on the auditorium service, not renewing that contract and having a lower level of service there. That's that is an option because and that's something that we have had discussions on at a council level over the course of the last year or two. So that's something that you can look at. And I put there in fiscal 21, a hundred thousand dollar savings, and then. In 22, up to 200,000, and that reflects the contract ending at midway through a year. And that's what that's what the goal was for that to, to become self-sufficient somewhat. So, um, well, that's somewhat. not nece necessary. I mean, you, I mean, theoretically, you could say you can let them continue to operate it with no city subsidy or a mm -hmm. significantly reduced city subsidy. This, or you could look at it as from the perspective that you can operate it with that without with that significantly reduced subsidy, we're going to take it back over and we're going to s reduce the staffing level on it. Okay. And that was one of the options that we had talked about last year. We've been wrestling with this for a long time, you know, with this auditorium deal. So. And the, the problem is, is that you're two months into a new arrangement with that and it's kind of yeah. hard to put that out there. And yet, as you start to think about how are you going to address this as we get move into the future, you got to be thinking through what are the alternatives you're at least willing to be talking about to try to make that happen. It's hard to keep the auditorium or talk about it though without understanding what the next two and a half years looks like. So sure. yep. I mean, I've yep. I, I'm already hopeful of it. To be honest, I'm with hopeful you. too, man. Because they had a great crowd there Saturday night, and they have extreme midget wrestling coming up March 30th. What? <laughs> so Nobody sent me an invitation. <laughs> they should have no, at least have a gym. But anyways, I mean, it's <laughs> not, you I'm know, a participant. I'm not. That's, that's, I mean, that's lighthearted, but I do have high hopes that they're going to be able to turn that around. So too, John. Yeah, I don't. I don't like to have. I mean, yes, it's something for us to think about. Um, as maybe like a two-way conversation of we're going to reduce, you know, how, how can you be self-sufficient for them? But as far as just banking on them not, I don't want to do that. So I don't, I don't see that as an option for one of any of it these It would be pretty hard to say that that was an option for you to say now. Yeah. And I don't know yeah. that you need to have a definitive <coughs> solution, but what are you at least willing to consider? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, this, the other page had a couple of other options, and something that I, the big thing about this is just going to be pushing the, a bill that is being considered at the state legislature and what, how that could potentially impact this whole discussion moving forward. Um, there is a bill in for enhanced funding on ground emergency medical transport, GEMT. Um, that is federal funds that flows through the state. Uh, 
There have been a few states that have signed on to this. Uh, just getting signed on, though, is not the only stuff that needs happen to happen, is, is my understanding of how this process works. And what's that, what's that going to mean to us, Jim? So if the state does pass this, it's attached to the, we have the deauthorization bill on the, on, or the deappropriation bill, on the, I think on the Senate side, not the House side. The two bills don't match, so right. it's on one of them. Um, if it gets, if it stays on that and is part of that and gets approved, you get the get authorized on that. When all the mechanics are gotten in place on that, it should mean. And I have in here three hundred fifty thousand. I'm not sure the what the dollar amount is. Uh, as Chief Traxel talked about it, you you thought that you could potentially see up to four hundred thousand come through on this for funding. Um, this is a that bill moving through and what it have means for impact on operations is very significant. What's it do? Yeah. Uh, it, Medicare funding for. Do you want to talk about how what the mechanism is designed to do and what it's providing reimbursement for that we don't currently get? It's actually for to make up the cost of medical transport for Medicaid patients. So. Uh, so it's like a backfill. Mm -hmm. So currently, an average transport in Burlington, you get $121 or so for Medicaid patient. This lets you recoup the rest of the cost. So, it was like seventy, it's like 70, 75 bucks. Is that what it was? Mm -hmm. That was like seventy-five dollars. Uh, well, I just asked Dana the other day. She said $121. Okay. What we get? What's it cost us? Well, our bill depends on the type of calls, 600, but you could actually recoup the cost. So there's a there's a very complex formula for us to figure out what does an ambulance transport cost us. It's not $600 that we normally bill. It's actually more than that. You have to take your your budget and the number of calls. Anyway, it, looking at Muscatine, they kind of figured theirs out. We kind of went off of theirs. Mm -hmm. What their cost is, we'd be very similar in cost of transport. What we have over Muscatine is way more Medicaid patients than they have. We had about a thousand transports last year that were Medicaid patients. So it's somewhere around a third of our transports in Burlington. So compared to two or three hundred in Muscatine. So that's where we Chief, make them. Chief, while you're standing there, mm -hmm. um, the four options Jim's presented <coughs> of the three, or three of the four, include eliminating at least three fire positions, if not six. So yeah. when we took on the grant, um, you basically provided an outline to show an extreme need for the positions that were hired. Right. So one of my questions is going to be is if we go, if we lose the three positions, uh, obviously if we know if we lose the six, we're back where we were before. But if we lose the three positions, one of the things that you brought up during that description for need was the two in, two out rule. Um, if we lose those three positions, does it put us back in a position where we're going to be, we could potentially have that arise again? Well, it would depend on what we do with the minimum staffing. So if you leave minimum staffing where it is now at 11 per ship, you know, each day there's at least 11 firefighters on duty. That allows us to have the third ambulance staff. So you could reduce three firefighters total and keep 11 minimum staffing. We'd still have three ambulances all the time. And it's those. The ambulance that goes with the engine that provides your two in and two out. Sorry, mm -hmm. engines only have two on them, not a driver and a officer. So, yes, what we what we save by having the six, of course, is the overtime cost. So we keep eleven staffing, so you kind of have a little bit of a cushion in there. If somebody calls in sick or is hurt, you're not hiring overtime every time somebody's hurt or or sick. So, back, you know, this year we're gonna have really good overtime. You know, good as in not spending near as much money as we've spent in the past, which is great for our department, for the guys, for the city, not to spend, you know, one hundred fifty, two hundred thousand dollars on overtime because it's not healthy for our department to spend that kind of you know, that have people work those kind of hours. So sure, they need their time off. So yeah, so going down the three, I mean, yes, we could do that if we, but we'd have to increase our overtime uh, dollars or budget. But we could still pretty much run like we are right now. How much do you think that would increase? We were different years. It's hard to say. One seventy to one hundred eighty thousand dollars a year. Stuff. You're right. Year. It just depends. You you can have a really good year, and then the next year have two people that are on long-term injuries, and it just 
You were just really? over 100,000 or just under this year, right? Well, I th we're right at, I think the last time I looked, we were in the 70,000. Oh, but but that early summer, oh, okay. before we got the grant, we were we were down. We had a couple people hurt, and we had a lot of overtime. This last payroll, I, we had one overtime shift, so we're doing way better. So how the uh, brush fire of the great brush fire of 2018? How'd that turn out? Everybody make it? Oh safe? yeah, it turned out great. Yeah, we had a good response. So that's where we spend our overtime, and that's kind of what we, you know, if you're gonna have overtime, that's what you want it for, right? When you have a big mm -hmm. event, you call people in off duty, and they're there for three, four hours, and then they go home. You don't like them working double shifts, 24 extra hours or 48 hour shift. You guys good? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chief. Thanks, Chief. Something with that to show, um, you know, I put in there even a couple examples with the, that enhanced ambulance funding. You could, you could, tr you could try to do a scenario where you don't reduce any of the fire positions um, and reduce the auditorium, or you could do it where you don't impact the auditorium uh, and reduce some or staffing at the. The option four there, where you reduce three positions in the fire department at the end of the grant, um, to try to get to that scenario where you get an, an okay ongoing budget. Um, within those, I, I guess that last one kind of talks about what kind of impacted the, the funding from the. We get if that legislation goes through the state, we get enhanced Medicare funding, Medicaid funding. Um, when we get money from the CTAA, it's based off our operating losses. So if we get money from a statewide level, it will at least be partially offset by losing some of the revenue that we would be collecting from CTAA. Because we're to, we're gonna. The nice thing is, is that extra funding means that our will be operating at a surplus on the operational side, uh, still having to buy equipment, but at least for operations that we have enough funds there to cover our, our cost for operations potentially. So we'll, but we'll lose the thirty to 35000 we're receiving currently from the CTAA, and potentially even with if you move three additional personnel over into that funding scenario, you may still be aware you're receiving effectively nothing towards operations. I kind of wanted to be able to show that with the, that all the CTA cost allocation being at zero, even with in, in those both of those scenarios, We're probably losing some of that. Um, and really, that's just to give you this, the things that I can think about that we have talked about and and over the course of the last six to 12 months. Oh, dude, this is it. Um, this these is it. are the kind of things, at least, that we have, have been the major talking points about what could potentially be looked at. And you may want to go some other route. You may say, uh, you know, that none of this is viable. None of these things work. Um, we want to go back to Matt's proposal. Or you may say we want to go to a different proposal. Um, I mean, bringing up the franchise fee, I mean, at the end of the day, we just have to decide if, if either A, we're going to make adjustments, or B, we want to try and come up with the fun, a different funding source. Um, I mean, I'm not a huge fan of getting rid of firefighters, but if, if, if Chief says that with the three that he can adjust and still be able to operate, then, I mean, that's something to definitely take with us down the road. I'm not a giant fan of, of eliminating a, 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 um, a police position. Uh, I think that's something we just got to a point where uh, we're able to operate and handle the call load we've got. I'd like to see us add to that actually over time to be able to do some different things. Um, but um, that's the biggest question we have to answer is do we just adjust the budget if we can? There's some big numbers there that we're relying on, right, Tim? I mean, if that, if that doesn't make its way through the Senate, if the enha enhanced ambulance funding doesn't come in, those are all some. Those are big numbers, yes. Yeah. And, those you know, and, and backfill still sits out there as 
a potential headwind. I knew, you, I knew you'd come that. through. I knew you'd come through. We haven't made it to a council meeting without using well, the term backfill. I, I, it's just a significant thing that sits out there. It's I don't sure. want, I don't model that in as a potential it's loss. It's always anywhere, looming, uh, but it's something that could potentially have happened. I mean, I think it, until the until the state's done with their their uh, their session, I don't know that we can do a whole lot. We need to know what those numbers look like before, and what those program, programs look like before we can come up with solutions to our issues. I appreciate this. Everybody's yeah. got everybody's got a foundation. Yeah. We can, we know what we've got what we've got to deal with, and what you know. Well, and, and and you know the the thing is regarding the fire or police. I, I I appreciate the fact that we're trying to save money on OT, but the fact of the matter is. O overtime happens. I mean, it's happening in factories every day right now. There's one factory in town that I have friends that work at. They've had mandatory overtime since I can recall, since since I've been around. So I as long as that overtime cost doesn't outweigh uh, the the expense, and it looks to me like there is some room there, so and that is going to go up and down uh, from time to time. I'd be, my thing would be, I'd be uh, in, in favor of an option of a blend of three and four, because I think uh, my belief is that we are going, you know, should be able to reduce the auditorium. Uh, maybe not in the agreement, but we should be able to modify that after three years. So they, uh, there's some talented people there, and they should be able to figure out a way to run that cheaper. That's why we put them in charge. So um, I, that I'm, I'm, I'm more in favor of the let's curtail some spending until we see how things rebound. Uh, than, than increasing any any further taxes, whether it be property or franchise fee or anything like that. So, I just want to throw out there um, just that uh, just to remind everybody, not that you need the reminder, but I'm going to do it anyway. It's uh, year to year, and sometimes as you make decisions, uh, uh, most of these decisions they're not long-term decisions. You know, nothing stays the same. These are temporary decisions. So, whether it's more money we have to pinch. Um, it's not long term. You have to you have to look at that. Sometimes you just have to do things to get over the hump, and it happens in households. It happens Everywhere. to me all the time. Yep. You know, we have to make uh, business decisions, um, and uh, I, I just want to remind everybody that as we do <laughs> move forward, well, you know, that and that again, once we do something, it's not like it's locked in. Oh my goodness! Yeah, you know, well, that, like that. That I agree. A discussion doesn't necessarily mean a decision. Right. And I've told a lot of people that over the past ten days, the discussion doesn't necessarily mean a decision. And, and I'm grateful to have this, Jim. Yep. Gives us some more yeah, options to play around with, and thank you. Are we good? <laughs> I mean, it's not we're like great. we're making a decision on this yeah. budget tonight, you yeah. know what I'm saying? But I agree around. with Matt, we're kind of, we're kind of I mean, stuck we, on something. Yeah, we can't do anything down. until we figure out what we've got in front of us, so. So, but thanks for putting this together, because it's good news. As we talk with the rating agency this week, talk about where how we're dealing with our uh, upcoming deficits how would the council like like us to frame um, what your attitude is for trying to deal with this um, I would say probably in my opinion that we'd be looking at future cuts to spending in I would agree with that. Some, kind of yeah, yeah I, I would I say you can present this to them. So these are four options that we're considering. Uh, so that you know, and that that should I would think. I, I'm not normally used to dealing with bonding oh, uh, agencies, so, but I would say that those are four options we're looking at. So we are trying to be proactive. But you're, it's these are things that are in the, on the, the the realm of realism for how you would have for me yes. to deal with this. Yeah. Some of yeah, them, that's yeah. just for me. Absolutely. Yeah, we're trying to be fiscally conservative and probably get our, our scissors out. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what, Matt I'm, I'm going to remain positive. You know, I'm, I still uh, I, I still want to remain positive, and you know, you never know what could happen throughout this year. Mm -hmm. So, um, but we also have to pull the gym for no and be prepared for news that we might not want to get. So, uh, but yeah, I, I can appreciate okay. this. I think that's we're good to go on that. Thank you for the work on that. Thanks, Jim. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, he's talking to Jim. You want to read another <laughs> ordinance or something? Yes, man, something. yes. <laughs> he wants Does more practice. Does anybody uh, appointments? We've got uh, we've got uh, Linda Hill for uh, I think you have enough for uh, 
this, yeah, Linda Hill for the low rent housing. So you going to put it in? not in the packet. Uh, right. We Sorry. had it. She, Katie didn't get it put on, but it will be on for next week unless we had an objection that came up. Just wanted to let you know about that is an, an additional appointment that we'll have for next week's consideration. And actually, she, I had, I had she another. All of us? Huh? Is she joining all of them? No, the, she's there, her interest. I think it's just low, low That's rent, just, right? She, the, okay. when they, when, when people fill out an, an application, they yeah, I saw they it, essentially I saw be it. interested in. Um, I also no, had a second all, just a low rent that I just have to get a confirmation if it's two miles if, if she lives within two miles of the city okay. limits. Uh, and you want me to give that name tonight, or uh, I think you probably want to wait. And okay. Wait. Okay. But yeah, there's three openings on the low rent housing. We need to get. Some fill so they can get the forum. And and I also need I also need a uh, a gentleman and I won't say a man I need a gentleman uh, on the uh, animal control board. It's a tough job and I've got nothing but ladies and God bless them they're working so hard. But I, I do need uh, I need some manpower on there. I need somebody that knows how to work with these uh, these wonderful ladies that have such a tough job. So if there's anybody out there that's interested, it's a tough job. Um, you're dealing with people and their pets. Um, but it still has to be done. And if there's anybody out there uh, that is interested, if you are a gentleman, uh, we certainly uh, we certainly could use you. Uh, and you can fill out an application on the city website. You can do that online. Um, that's all I have on appointments. And are all the other appointments okay? I'm good. They were fine with me. They seem good. Yeah. I don't see any problem. With that. Okay. Uh, we've come to the end, my friends. You guys have been so patient tonight, Mr. Tislin. I'm going to be adding. Uh, we had an agreement with the Burlington Schools, a proposed agreement. We're going to have a set date for hearing on that, so that'll be for the February 26th work session and March 5th council meeting, so we'll have discussion at that time on uh, the proposed agreement for use of the tennis courts. Um, Mrs. Murray, counselor. Yes, I had the opportunity to attend the Chocoholic Frolic last weekend. They should never let you if go. you were not there, you missed out. As a dietitian, I was in heaven because you know when you eat a lot of chocolate, <laughs> when you eat a lot of chocolate, it is mood enhancing. So I was happy all day long, and I know you're going to blame it on the glass that I had at uh, Olive Wine, but no, it was not that. The chocolate was really, really good. In fact, I am going to plan on going to downtown Burlington and buying Valentine gifts for all my sweeties because they have some really great Valentine Day gifts down there. So I'm really, really excited. And for the uh, 10 cross country skiers in Burlington, the snow is really, really good at Stars Cave right now. So uh, I'll see you out there on the slopes. I guess you don't call it slopes when you on ski. The <laughs> on the flatlands, yes. Mr. Billups, counselor. Well, you have chocolate, I have Budweiser. Anyway, uh, great, great, uh, great event at the auditorium this this last week with the Memorial Auditorium. They were packed house. It was fantastic. What so was the show? It was uh, MMA fights, good oh, fights all the way around. I think that one was, good. was a little bit of a clunker, but uh, it was great to see the place full, and so it, and it was working well, and, and that's a good job. So, awesome. um, out of that, that's it. MPT. Of course. Well, with Valentine's Day coming around, there's all kinds of stuff going on downtown. Bent River is having um, something, and they're having live music. Uh, check that out. The library, of course. Um, they're having cookie decorating, and it's a free event, so you just have to, you know, register. But you know, do you need judges for that? Cookies, <laughs> cookies and books. You can't go wrong. Um, there's just, I think everything, something is going on at every place downtown. The Art Center has Valentine's Day dinner. You have to get reservations, so you got a couple days still for that. Maybe, I'm not sure, they might have sold out. Um, Civic Music also has their event on Valentine's Day. It's the, an Irish, um, Dublin Irish Dance. So that's at the Memorial Auditorium. And I hear that one. I hear a lot of people love that show. Um, yeah, and I went and saw Charlie and the Chocolate Factory oh. at the Capitol Theater on Saturday, and that was amazing to see on the big screen. I bet. You're goofy, man. That was awesome. Okay, Mr. Rinker, counselor, nothing. Jim Furneaux, city manager. Radio on Wednesday. 
Um, I'm I in on that. I can do it. Okay. So I'm free Wednesday. We're good on that. All right. That's nine, nine o'clock. Southeast Iowa Days this next week for two council members who signed up, and I think I'll be there. You're going to Nick. So that's next Wednesday. It's going to be a party. Uh, Thursday. Thursday. Wednesday and Thursday. Yes. Wednesday and Thursday. Yes. Yes. It starts about. I think it's eleven. I think about my calendar. Thirty or eleven or twelve. <laughs> And next week's meeting, r reminder, is on Tuesday, not on Monday. And That's right. So. And tomorrow. What's tomorrow? Is the citizen? Thursday. 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 Just Thursday. Just Thursday for you. Yep. Is that all you That's got, James? It. That's it. Uh, just want to wish everybody happy Valentine's Day and two days. It's the 14th. Valentine's Day is for lovers. So, Jeremy. Anyways, uh, I just want to thank Hal Chase for the. I said do that. I just want to thank Hal Chase today. Uh, he, his, uh, his email is Hal Chase Beyond Race. Rhonda was there. We had a luncheon today. And uh, I want to thank Hal for spending time in Burlington and uh, spending money in Burlington. And a good, good conversation. He's going to do some good things, so it was a really good deal. I uh, just want to encourage everybody, too, to make sure you get out to eat in Burlington. Uh, I went down to Big Muddy's. We, it's new ownership now, and uh, it's my first time getting to eat down there since the ownership changed. The food was just as good. I had a Reuben today that was heavenly. Chief, you loved it, my friend. But anyways, uh, get out, support uh, local business. I think that's it. Are we good to go? Good. All right, Annie, take us out. This meeting is over.